we're good to go. Um, I'm guessing originally on the schedule set for starting, the games are obviously a little bit behind the schedule, um, so I will get started. Um, I think we're all where we're supposed to be, so this is going to be a session on Drupal and higher education. Um, my name is Dan Fitzsimmons, I'm from the University of Calgary. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about the process we've gone through of designing and developing websites for everyone, some of the good, some of the bad. Um, so the thing about higher education institutions in general is that we have a distinct set of challenges because we have to make websites that really do fit lots of different use cases, such as for faculty, departments, sometimes small groups, services, personal sites at times. So it does make it sometimes difficult to make sure that we're choosing a solution that would work for everybody. So that's one thing that we've, uh, I think all higher education institutions can struggle with, is to make sure that we actually have some, a product that they can work for everything, the templates that work for everything. Um, you can have different customers who want things like, you know, especially when it comes to like the executive, they might want specialty plan services um, that would work especially for them. Um, and that's not always something that can work for everyone who issues a product. So one thing that we have to do in higher ed as well is, is make sure that we support as much as possible. There is always a uh, mandate to support as much as you can because when you don't, we find that people will often try and go outside. Um, go to a contractor, go to some kind of vendor, get them to make the website that you want. And then we run into more problems when it comes to support long term because people try to bring the sites back onto campus and we can't really support them. So we're trying to develop a product on campus that will work for as many use cases as possible, have the support model in place, this is what we've done, um, so that people can actually rely on us to get what they need done as much as we can. So we have that general part, we're trying to support as much as possible. Um, one thing I'm going to be talking about today as well is kind of the evolution of the University of Calgary service. So like where we've started and where we're going. Um, so you kind of get an idea of like a uh, school that's been doing it for a very long time on Drupal. Um, and what we've uh, been able to achieve. We're also going to talk about our setup with multi-site, its pros and its cons, um, as well as a little bit on where we are now as far as the second vendor we actually have um, software service on Pantheon. Um, so, my, so again, my name is Dan Simmons. I'm a senior web developer at University of Calgary. Uh, I've worked with Drupal now since about 2006. Originally, I came on as a um, student doing contract work. Um, doing a few of the very first sites that were mostly service level sites that were trying to uh, move over into the system because they were more student facing and wanted to get all the new things that were coming out with Drupal um, and just to take the best advantage they could of, of the product. Um, right now I'm assisting and hosting over 900 Drupal sites that are in production. We have probably another 500 or so that are in different stages of development. So it's like development sites, testing sites, training sites. Um, that are still exist on our production server, still have to maintain them, but we have about 900 that are actually proxy and available to the world. Um, we also do development for the University of Calgary's new homepage, which is hosted on Pantheon, it's been there for about a year. And so part of uh, the work I do is trying to balance all of that, and right now work in mostly the development space, but there's a lot of other things that I do. Um, I've also worn many, many hats over the years I've been there. First starting out as a student, going on to be called the head of web migration for a little while because we moved people into Drupal. We needed somebody to dedicate to the site building aspect. We had to get these people in. Um, also working as an e-developer for a while as we were working on the Pantheon homepage and some of the special projects there. And then on to being a senior developer as we continue to work on the entire project. So why do we use Drupal in higher education? Why does it work for, for schools? Why does it Calgary as well. For us, the big one was, of course, there being no annual renewal fees for software. That's a big thing as IT budgets are often quite frugal in institutions like uh, universities and colleges. We often have to be concerned about how much things are going to cost. Um, so we were looking at things like, can we save money on the software versus like having to have annual renewal licenses, things like that. It would be a big problem for us going long term. We have a lot of other fixed costs. So there are a lot of things that we have. Uh, of course, like the course software, things like that, we have to pay for other vendors. That's fixed, can't really do much about it. So one place where we could actually get some kind of cost saving was by looking at different web software that was open source. So Drupal is one that we looked into uh, in 2006 to make our movement um, into something a bit new. 
Um, one thing as well with being on um, this department of basic technologies, this is the area I'm part of, um, since it was like a centralized department, one thing we had was a lot of people could do things like install um, SQL, the kind of PHP software, set up a server, do kind of middleware applications. So those people were out there already. So we can get them, leverage them to these things that we set up on a machine. So we had some dedicated and mostly old machines that were uh, kicking around. Probe group launch with, let's give it a try. So that's kind of how we got everything started. So in the early days, one thing as well, we had a pretty good developer community out there, especially in Drupal. We had some developers, of course, could write PHP, no problem, working at UC. So it was nice that there was both our people and the community out there that could work on some kind of applications. So that's one of the reasons we decided to go with it. Um, the nice thing is, of course, the ability to have it customized if we wanted to. Um, and we've done more of that as we go along. When we started out with Drupal 4, um, we weren't doing too much custom development. But as we moved on, of course, to Drupal 7 is where we are now. We can have some customized, and we do have to customize, uh, particularly with the Pantheon environment we're on now. We've done a lot of custom coding. To go into a bit more close to the end of the presentation about some of the things we've done um, to try to improve the service. Um, one thing that's nice about Drupal courses. If someone's not core, there are these missing features you can add on. So we've been doing that a lot. You know, we're adding on contributed modules that would fit our needs. We're trying to be careful about that as much as we can because we have this running an enterprise application for us. So we have to be quite careful. It's nice that Drupal though is flexible with these kind of things. It's got lots of flexible options. I uh, think we can change. Um, system integration is a big point too for us. That of course you can connect with any number of systems, some you don't know about when you're first starting up the project. So we've uh, had things like you know setting it up with a lot of JSON connections, um, XML feeds into different systems. Um, we have a large profiling system that we have work, uh, being still alive in the University of Calgary. We have a profiling system that's connected to various systems like PeopleSoft. It could actually get profile data of both professors and other staff members. Um, so those are some of the huge pluses for us. And the nice thing about being able to build both sites, both big and small because you can customize the software as you go along. <laughs> so we adopted Drupal in 2006. So we've been doing it now for over 10 years. Um, it basically became our, our website station. We just said, like, this is what we're moving to. There was no um, room, really, for you can have now your old product and we have this product. We're like, no, we're setting up a new service with Drupal. We're going to set it up a team, and they're going to support it. So you have a decision to make with these like, <coughs> faculties and departments is that you can move and we'll give you support. Um, so we tried to focus on transitioning to you know, a more modern look at the time, 2006 look of websites. So basically having like nice tab structure and, and left navigation links that would actually connect together, make it a whole lot easier for people to create content on their site. We basically had a blank template to fill. So we tried to make it quite easy for content administrators in particular to just get your site set up. Like you can do images, you can do files, all that kind of stuff. Quite easily, where before you know, had the FTP stuff up and you would have talked to uh, a lot of these content administrators. They weren't necessarily doing that work, they were often hiring somebody to do that work. So it, it made it so they were paying a lot of money on that kind of thing. Um, so it was like, you can do it yourself, that would save your department's also lots of money. So in part of this, um, our old system was very decentralized. We had lots and lots of different kinds of websites out there. We had people, of course, using things like Dreamweaver, front page, um, all kinds of things just thrown on to any server they could find. Sometimes they paid a lot of money for an outside vendor to host the service. Um, you know, a lot of companies that were um, big, especially in Calgary, around the time, you know, hosting different environments and custom, very customized sites. So one thing we ran into when we we thought of like, doing this change over to something else, and we looked at a few different products, and it wasn't what we chose. But when we looked at the different products, what we wanted to do is make sure we had that brand. Because one thing the old sites had as a problem was they looked different. So it was like, when you hit a University of Calgary website, you know, this is a University of Calgary website. They looked the same. So the idea was to get people over to the system as quickly as we could so that we'd have that consistency in brand. So, um, one thing we decided to do when we uh, made that was, of course, go with the non-cost recovery model, go in a little bit more. One other thing that motivated us to do the push was we were 
feature on web pages at suck.com <laughs> um, because of our old look. So on that site, what they were basically focusing on, uh, and they, they admitted in the video capture they made of our site, was that <laughs> it's changed by the time they'd actually uh, posted the video. Um, but we had what they called mystery meet navigation on the old site. So what that was is that you'd have to hover over links to see what they were. So almost everything was hidden. So when you tried to find out, like, you know, looking for information about the faculty of engineering, for example, you had to hover over all these links and be like, oh, which one's the faculty of engineering? And it would pop up. You might forget where it was and have to go back and look again. So, you know, there were legitimate criticisms, and we, luckily, at that point, were already on our way to this new idea. So we are trying to use these new layouts as well to get the clients moved over. So we decided for the whole um, new service that we're going to do non-cost recovery, we're going to build a team that had most of the components people needed. Um, so we, this team still exists, um, yeah, it's changed a lot over the years, but really what it was is we were focused first on service. Get customer service people there who know how the service works, they understand it, we build training and documentation, um, videos where we can. Um, basically style guides, things like that, to understand the brand and how they could use the brand. Um, trying to basically move the um, purpose of content updates um, where, to site administrators, so it takes it off like a centralized web team, because it just with the number of people we had, it wasn't possible. So we made it so we can help them in the early stages to move the content into Drupal. Um, and that was part of what we wanted to do with the non-cost recovery, is let's encourage people to move to this brand. We know we had problems with the old brand, we know we were highly decentralized and that wasn't working. So let's get people moved to Drupal, we'll, we'll hire people like myself as site builders, get the content moved, then people who actually work in these different faculties and departments didn't have to worry about it. We you moved your stuff, do you like your new website? Cool, put it online. Um, so generally we got things moved over quite quickly by using this model, but when people had questions, they're like, I don't know how this whole new platform works, which never would come up, we had people already in place to answer those questions. So one thing the University of Calgary did as part of the idea of like, let's not have people be charged for the service is we set it up as a critical service by information technologies to have websites. We need them. Um, we need to also promote ourselves, of course. We always want to have students come to the University of Calgary, so we have to make sure we have good websites that people understand and navigate and would get continuous support. So, We've been trying to encourage people to move to this service the whole time because this is something we're always going to provide. It's always going to be there for you as a service. Another reason we wanted to do it, as I had mentioned before, is we had a lot of people using contractors. They hired, of course, summer students. If you get into university, they hire somebody like for a few month term over the summertime and be like, here, go me a new website for your professor. And then it's some like random front page site that's built all in JavaScript. It's like, how am I going to support this long term? It's completely unique. So we wanted to prevent people from doing that. Like, don't go out and just hire some random person or a vendor um, who doesn't understand the brand. So we tried to make sure we had guidelines on the brand. And they would stop doing this, like stop going out and actually just hiring a random vendor or a person to build their website. Uh, because we're going to have a free option. Like, we have something that works, it's stable, you can just put your stuff in there, and that's really all you need if you just need a, like a web presence. Then, uh, by basically setting up pretty strict at the beginning standardization, I mean, like, here's we were being like Drupal Core when we started. Uh, no, not much to trim. Um, this allowed us to basically have sites, uh, post web information technologies that would maintain a pretty rigorous standard. So we had policies in place where we're like, we're not going to allow you to go out to get a vendor that builds your website that's not Drupal, that's like some random technology. You're going to say, hey, can you host this on your machine so it's not going hosting costs? No. You have to use Drupal. You have to build within our template if you want our support. Now we can not say we never hosted those kind of websites. They do get hosted sometimes, but you're not going to get a support model. So the nice thing was, yeah, there was no service cost from the web team at all. So like, you know, if someone wanted custom development on the Drupal site once they started moving over, we could provide that to a limited extent. When we first started out, we were focusing on just getting the content over, but there were some people who needed, like, started to realize there was a developer community out there. Let's get some models and solve and do some, a bit of custom code to get things going. Um, now we still don't do 
across the country right now having two platforms. So I mentioned before, we have Pantheon um, as well, and they're hosting our university homepage as well as some other microsites. Um, so only got set up in the last year or so, um, but we decided we're not going like, to have two different models. We're just going to be like, okay, everything's free. Um, basically, most of the new development is going to the Pantheon side, uh, but we're just trying to encourage you, like, once that platform is completely ready, um, we can actually move people over there and it's not going to change the service model. They're used to not paying for anything, they're used to having um, basically a team that will help them out all the time, so we're still here. So, there's the web services team at UFC. So, we've had different names over the years, this is where we are now. We're called the web content management team, but we decided to kind of pigeonhole us a little bit too much um, to be like, you're the Drupal team. But now we actually have to, of course, handle different products than just Drupal. Drupal is, of course, our biggest thing that we work on. Um, we basically provide tier two and three level support for people. So, we have tier one, they go through the general IT support desk at the university. But then when they have higher level questions, they tend to go to uh, one of our customer service staff or a more technical resource like myself to try and um, offload those problems that would go to the like, site administrator trying to solve it. Like, we get a PHP error, they don't know what to do with it, so they send it through us. So it helped out a lot to basically not have those people have to go back to, like, previously going back to a vendor and being like, paying hundreds of dollars for them to fix a problem. Now, the web services team that generally on campus could do it for free. Um, as we've moved along, the site building aspect has become more limited because we now are focused much more on development and new technology. And of course, a fair bit of maintenance that comes from running an enterprise software. You have to maintain a lot of old sites. Um, so, mostly when we did things in the early days, we went around using panels, um, just like trying to modify those slightly here and there when we needed to. Um, we also try to leverage Drupal as much as we could, though. Um, so in Drupal 7, you know, we use things like the features module to set up uh, basic functionality, defaults, things like that on sites. So we're trying to use Drupal as much as we can still. But we have some development support in terms of CSS, HTML, PHP, so you have the designers who can do that. Um, what you can do, of course, you know, they need custom queries, they need, um, you know, jQuery things to be installed or built. We can do a lot of those things. Um, we just kind of change our intake model over time. Um, this also allowed websites to be hosted on the university's campus, which would make things a bit easier for us. You know, of course, a lot of people are moving to a lot of cloud-based services. You know, we're, of course, as well, looking into that. But right now, we're hosting a lot of things on campus because it allows us to have the control. Um, one thing we could try to do as well is even people have had custom domains, they register with various services like GoDaddy or um, you know, a lot of other Canadian ones too. Um, they will try to um, keep ownership of that, like have control of the domain. But people forget, people leave the university. So people will be tied to a certain email address that might be disconnected. So these addresses would sometimes expire and you never know what they're going to Some will buy up the domain once they realize it's free. Um, and they, they never know. We've had a couple of cases where we had random stuff be put on like our. Um, old residence sites and things like that. It just would point to someone who's trying to spoof the university and that kind of thing. So we now are encouraging people to like, let's, let's take ownership. The University of Calgary and the IT team will take care of domains so that when they expire, they basically won't expire. You don't have to worry about cost. So that's one thing we're going to try to correct. Like, I'm sure there's lots of costs going into this. I don't personally see the numbers. But there's a lot of costs that we're now controlling that's getting taken away from the site administrators. They don't have to worry about renewals. They don't have to worry about how much the server costs. So that's really helpful for them. One thing we've done that uh, we think has been very effective for us is that we partnered very early on with the, what's called the University Relations Department. Um, so they are basically the external facing marketing kind of department at the university. So they came up with the brand. Um, and then they became, of course, then that way responsible for the brand. Um, so one thing that they've uh, been very helpful for us in is. Uh, Basically, the business owner. So one thing that was talked about by Alex at the beginning and the CEO was, uh, in the presentation for the keynote was about, you know, the, there are cases where there is no business owner. One thing we've tried to be very uh, good at to start out was that we had a business owner. The web at UFC, in terms of Drupal, is owned by university relations. So we deal with them. They get to answer the tough questions. We get to make the service work at IT. Like, they tell us what, like, what needs to happen. 
um, and then we try and make it work as best we can within technical limitations. Um, so there's lots of business decisions that come up. Uh, there's lots of things that people try to go radically off brand. It still happens because our main web has been sitting on the neighbors of campus. I think the last major change to the template was sometime in 2011. Um, so we have a wide screen version, but it's not responsive. If you go to the University of Calgary website for the most part, they're not responsive sites. Work in progress. So we're working on that. The university's homepage, which is completely you know, rebuilt, that's responsive for everything. So, you know, there is a push and we're trying to get people into the new model as much as we can. So we'll have to respect where we are. So when people come in and say, yeah, you know, I don't like your websites right now, I want to move off campus. I'm going to go with a, some outside vendor. We tell them, well, of course, you're not going to get any support. Don't try and bring out your website back to us because we're not going to host it. Um, and if you have questions about general things, about like what you can and can't do within your site, talk to university relations. So if they want to change things like colors, they want to have green text on their site, you talk to university relations and work that out with them. So like they're the police for us. So that's been really great for us. We now focus in our key on just like they have like university relations tell us this is the direction we're going in. They figure out the roadmap. We implement it. So we worked directly with them. We've done that model since 2006 when we started. It's gotten more tightly integrated over the years, and actually in the last year or so, it's actually probably the most it's ever been because now we actually sit with them. So we're on different parts of campus before. Um, always close. We met regularly with these guys, but now we actually sit in the same office space. So every meeting we go to, there's usually someone from university relations there too. So they know exactly what we're doing. We know exactly what they're doing. So when they are making decisions on the future of the brand. We're right there. Um, so we can meet every round for saying, oh, that's not technically possible, like all kinds of things. So it's nice that we're there the whole time. So the evolution of UFC. So this is um, how we got started to where we are now. Um, so we did start on a version 4.7, so we were pretty early days in terms of like the more stable build of Drupal. Um, that's what I got started. Um, so I just came in just after the case made the decision to move, um, but I helped move. <laughs> so uh, when we started on 4.7, we were using the very small modules, like basically core plus one or two modules, which we felt really were getting the kind of uh, major support they needed. Um, so there's a lot of hard things really like the install one more module, like the system admins are running the server at the time, because they knew that like they're, they were doing a lot of other things. So this was actually one piece of their pie, and just what they had to do in an average day. So Drupal, when they first started out, we were small, of course, we were just getting the first few sites moved over. Um, we wanted to get some contributed modules on, let's have some fun with this thing, let's do look at the modular approach that Drupal provides. So eventually, um, we expanded. Once we did that initial run, we were like, yeah, you know, that's some cool stuff, so let's, let's add more modules. So as we did that, we are adding more and more modules. We had other people who were um, early adopters of Drupal. Some people actually didn't do it directly through us, and they realized we're doing Drupal, so they made their own server and installed 4.7 on it as well. Um, you know, we bring them in later on. <laughs> but, you know, we shouldn't do this itself, let's do it with a central IT. Um, but they would be like, okay, well, I found them getting groups, so I'm gonna install that. Um, and they didn't necessarily know what it did, what its main purpose was. So they would uh, sometimes later on realize that, okay, well, I've installed organic groups, and now how do I do it? So that would come up, and in the early days of Drupal, luckily, between version four and version five, there were like huge architectural changes, so the move over wasn't too bad when we got there, but we had to look into things like, because we were just installing modules without any kind of thought of like, how are we gonna standardize them? What's our process gonna be as far as like review? Like, what's a good module, what's not a good module? Does this fit? a broader use case. Sometimes we were installing modules that of course were like one site like, oh I want uh, a different look for my teaser. So I'm gonna install this like teaser module for you. Uh, but one thing about what everyone would need. Um, because we were kind of we were thinking about the service because it was early as like okay we just got a couple of sites and they're all different. But we had to think about it later on as more of like a general enterprise level service. We have to all be doing the same thing. So we did perform a major upgrade uh, from version four to version five, and a few hundred sites around that time. Um, we tried to make as few changes as possible, but we had to also contend with that some modules just disappeared even between those two versions. 
just gone. We had it for a few more years and like, you know, we have to figure out something else. Um, and as we moved along though, we started getting into like the 500 plus sites that were on Drupal. We got into Drupal 5 days, we started um, customizing. People were asking for like more, they wanted like more features that we could build that were, didn't necessarily exist out in the Drupal developer community, like you know, they wanted their specialized ones for news events that are often used in universities, we have to have those kind of things. So we would uh, start working on that, making customized solutions. We built a custom profiling system that integrates with things like PeopleSoft, which is used for a lot of our uh, financial parts of the university. Um, it also had a lot of just data about people's you know, phone numbers and their offices and all that kind of stuff. All that data was always stored. So we leveraged it, brought that data into Drupal by making a bunch of custom modules, and connecting to .NET and all that kind of things. So a lot of crazy development happening at the time, and that's uh, still there. Um, we also worked on this sort of a system that was akin to SharePoint, basically a file sharing service, that you know, check in, check in, check out, files. So lots of that kind of stuff. So, as we started to look into, again, upgrades from five, again, ran into even bigger problems because we were thinking about, like, there's even more modules that don't exist past Drupal 5. So we were still not thinking about the long-term implications of what we were doing. We needed standards, we needed standards, we needed a process of how we review everything, every concerned module that goes in, what's its future state, do we see what's happening, do we see the community actually supporting this module long-term. So majority of our sites were still on Drupal 5. Actually, this slide's not quite accurate. We probably were there until about 2015. Piece of portion were there. Um, so between 2013 and 2014, we did our main push to get us off Drupal 5. Because we were getting into somewhere between 5 and 900 sites were in production of Drupal 5. And of course, Drupal 7 had been out since 2011. Or, well, January 2011, I believe, is the date. So. Drupal 5 at that point was end of life. So we had to contend with the fact that we're not going to get, get security updates. We have to manage this whole thing on our own, so we can't do this long term. So what we did was made the decision in late 2012, still moving like a bureaucracy, we made our decision quite late that we had to, to actually make a change uh, or go something, go something else. So we decided we're going to stay with Drupal, we're going to move to Drupal 7, and this is going to be our first time we're going to be like cutting edge. We can be on Drupal 7, but we waited a couple of years, kind of staying a little bit behind the curve um, for a uh, university, and that we waited until everything we needed was already there. Like, views was ready, panels was ready, all of those different components we've been using on Drupal 5 were all available. Um, so, when we did this, um, we uh, set up everything to make sure that we had all the two modules made. We had to actually do an entire process of working with the features module to build all of our default standards in Drupal 7 and rebuild pretty much everything we did in Drupal 5 in terms of custom development for all of our things like news and events and all those things that people now expected were going to work on their site. Uh, we had a couple of other random things to contend with, like we used, I'm not sure if anyone here used the old event module that was in Drupal 5. I guess nobody. <laughs> um, anyway, we, that was like, uh, workforce of our Drupal 5 system, like that was powering most events back in those days. That module ceased to exist partway through Drupal 6, like we didn't receive very much support once it got there, and it died. So we realized that, yeah, this Drupal 7 port's never going to happen, so we need to get off this thing. So we developed an entirely new event system based on features and some custom dev from there, um, and tried to move everything. So we had to do a whole bunch of mapping from there for as far as migration. So we migrated. Um, to about 900 of the site, well not quite 900, probably about 700 of the sites uh, were moved from Drupal 5 to 7 in the script. So, spent a great deal of time over those years figuring out every little problem that might happen as we moved along. Uh, generally starting out with very simple sites that like just use core Drupal, nothing much else. Um, they went over pretty, pretty well. Um, and then we were moving over sites that were a whole lot larger, that had a lot of custom dev. A lot of things like CCK and lots of views and all that kind of stuff. It's like we knew there was a lot of stuff that needed to happen between Drupal 5 and Drupal 7, just trying to make sure that all that stuff would move. So, spent a great deal of time with that, and that's a lot of our platform now. It's actually upgraded from 5. About 20% of the sites probably decided to 
rebuild. That just started. We're, we're at that point in our cycle that we need to rebuild the site anyway. Let's figure out all the stuff we don't need anymore and that kind of thing. So that was nice for us. Some of those larger players that had to wait a little bit longer, they decided they got to the point in their life cycle that they want to rebuild anyway. So that helped us to not have to upgrade some of them. But as happens in sometimes in enterprises, there are some legacy systems you have to keep around. So we actually still have Drupal 5 in a very limited capacity. So we have a few sites running on it, probably, uh, I think at most, by a couple dozen. Um, for a variety of reasons, many of them are running that old profiling system that just remains, and right now there's no suitable thing for it to move to. Um, the people who, who built it are in various different positions now, so it's not going to be rebuilt by them. So it's like, dude, what do we use instead? So it's remained sitting there for a while as you try to make those decisions. Um, so a lot of our customization we're preventing the upgrade more than anything else. One thing we've also done is uh, been uh, looking at uh, some other contrib modules that were like vitally important to some of these sites that uh, kind of made us stuck. So there's a few sites, we have some like magazine sites and things like that that we like tied to a module that doesn't exist past Drupal 5. And that's where we <laughs> ran into these problems where we had to think about the future state. Um, and we didn't at the time. We're like, this module fits exactly what you want. And we put it on. Um, and then when we, we realized later on, we're like, okay, this thing can't be upgraded. There's like a maybe a Drupal 6 port that's not really stable and of course no Drupal 7 port. And now we're in 2017. Drupal 7 is announced in 2011. You know, that port's not happening. So it's like you need to either rebuild or we have to make the port for you. And when it comes to an open source product like this, unless like someone else wants to use this thing, which they don't clearly, um, we don't feel the need to port those kind of modules anymore. So we are, you know, actually so many sites we really need to rebuild. But this happens in enterprise, I think, a lot. Is that like there's a lot of systems that just have to stick around for a variety of sometimes even political reasons. So we do have a few sites that still on Drupal 5, and every few months we're like, is there anybody else on Drupal 5? Can I query how many sites are on Drupal 5 to find out how many are left? It's like, it's the same number. It's the same number are there. <laughs> That's the reason they're there. Um, so we have remained this, um, remained uh, maintained this large on-prem service or on-campus service from 2006 to about 2016. That was the one service we had on Drupal. Um, it allowed us to um, basically think highly centralized, which is great. We made a lot of decisions as we went along about how we were going to try and improve things. Uh, but a decision was made at that time to let's move things um, to maybe another system. Let's look into products like Pantheon, Aquia, things like that. Um, one particular site that was a bother for us, one of the ones that did remain on Drupal 5 for a long time, was our homepage. Now, the reason I say I've stuck around so long is because it wasn't like the other site. The homepage receives about 16,000 hits a day, so it's a high traffic site. That means a lot of load dead on the server. So, what we did, uh, especially in the early days when we didn't have as much processing power as we do now, um, we would actually try to offload that processor time to scrape the site. So, basically, for those who don't understand what I'm talking about when I say scrape, um, basically, we just made static versions of the pages. So we made it into HTML files, images, files, things like that, and just made sure they were automatically put together so we had a static version of the Drupal site. Um, just for this one page. Um, so we've been working on that for many years. We've had scripts that just did this for people, like once they publish something, they go to the Drupal site, make their change, then go to a website, the pen and case, scrape for the home page, and it would make a copy. But the problem with this model was um, how long it would necessarily take to do that scrape. It was unknown. There was no real great way of monitoring what it was doing during the process. So it would be often we would receive support calls halfway through a scrape because as the site got bigger and bigger and bigger, there were more files to copy over. So you know there would be some panic, especially when you think of the time sensitive releases and like news and things like that. That where's the home page? <laughs> Why isn't it updated yet? Is the script broken? We get all those kind of questions, and sometimes it was broken legitimately, <laughs> but other times, you know, we just were like, you just have to wait five, ten more minutes, and it will be there. Uh, but there's panic when it comes to like time-sensitive things that have to go out. Like, we have announced the school name is changing at noon. 
you know, they put they try and put it up at 59. So like, it's gonna be like 15 minutes late. So it was unpredictable. We couldn't really determine how long the script was ever gonna take to run. So we had to look into something better. So we were like, of course we're gonna look at on campus service. Could we move this into Drupal 7? Maintaining sort of the same idea, but improving it upon it in some way. We looked at a couple of different options like boost and, and other things, but we decided um, that it's, we're going to look into vendors. So right now it's hosted on Pantheon. Um, so they are actually doing um, just hosting the university's home page and some of those microsites. Um, and that's where a lot of our custom development is going to now is to the entirely new look of the home page. So it wasn't just a project, let's just move the Drupal 5 home page up there. We re completely rebuilt the thing. Um, so I'm going to go into that a little bit more, like a bit about how it's been rebuilt, but we will be keeping the on-prem services, all the on-campus services, and the 900 other sites that are going to stay there for a while. Like how long it's going to take, we're not sure. Uh, but considering it took us like three or so years to move to Drupal 7 in the first place, it's going to remain for a while as we figure out what our next step is as far as like Drupal 8. Making sure that all the components we need are there. Um, so the two environments have pushed the need for us to really standardize. Um, so we learned a lot as we went over this through the years. Of like there's a lot of um, custom development we did, the three models we added. We weren't necessarily thinking about the long term implications. So we tried to come up with things like uh, how we're going to um, review modules from this point forward. How scrutinized do you have to make like every choice you make? We saw we had to pretty like, scrutinize everything. And part of that was working with the university relations department. There you had their needs and what they wanted built, um, but we had to make sure, like, okay, this is the this is the module that basically can do the work. We can do some depth from there, but we have to understand like these are the implications of it. Um, this is the support that's going to happen long term for it. So it's something we had to really be very careful about. Uh, one thing we developed as well when we moved to Drupal Seven in the first place is the entire concept. So we actually have a website at the University of Calgary that actually has uh, just all module review. We set up um, an ability to just post modules from Drupal, and from there, um, you basically um, say, hey, I want to install this. What does the rest of the group think? Just talking to the web services team. Um, we would have to have at least someone else go in there and prove it. You could just improve it yourself. We disabled purposely our admit account on that site, so like, the admitting could just go in there and say, oh, I approve this. Um, so we try to fix that in full. Um, and with that, though, our scripts that actually allowed us to do the installations would require that site to be approved. Oh, sorry, that module to be approved before it would actually install it for you. So if it didn't show up in the list of approved, it basically was just a JSON services export. Um, it wasn't in that blob of JSON data. It was not allowed to be installed. So it prevented especially those who were more on the service side of our, of our service, uh, custom service people, they didn't really have any ability to install a module unless they were through the process. So it made things a little bit better for us to have a bit of more control. With the Pantheon environment, since we're with the um, university relations people all the time, we scrutinize every module, every brick, uh, every permission. And I say brick because that's the language we use at UFC to talk about the new website. So bricks is, uh, kind of the um, terminology we used to do a lot of our new custom dev, which is mostly built around panels, page manager, um, and a few other things. Um, so there's a lot of uh, custom dev being done there to basically build fully responsive content through panels and page manager and that kind of thing. Um, we also wanted to move, of course, to standardized field types in Drupal, because before, on our on-prem stuff, we built a lot of custom stuff that was making up our own things, and we wanted to make sure that when we decided to upgrade, it would be so complicated beyond what we've done in custom dev. So, this is UFC as far as our service. So, I don't, of course, show Pantheon because I don't have insight into exactly what it looks like on their end. Um, but basically, um, people coming into the internet would hit our F5 machine, which would basically route traffic into what our proxy machines, which we just call C4 or C5. The classification was, and they basically decide: Are you an on-campus request or are you an off-campus request? An off-campus request would go into Pantheon. Um, so, from there, though, really want to direct your attention more to the second half of the graph, where we have those three machines in a line. That is Drupal Seven for us for on-campus. Like that's as much resources as we have. 
it's kind of a point of pride for us to be able to achieve 900 sites in a multi-site and only run on, that, that's actually overstating. The third machine is in there. Um, it's actually only two machines connected to one database server. That is our 777 setup. Um, we have, the web, the web3 machine does exist, but it's not actually hooked up. So you can have the same file system to share, the same database information to share, but the web3 machine actually is not in production, so no one can actually go to web3 from ukali.ca and actually get the site posted off there. We use it for releases right now. It makes it things a little bit easier for us. You know, no one else is on this machine when we're trying to run something. <laughs> it's just web services. So for a while, it's what we're doing to hopefully speed up our releases a little bit. Um, so, but that's it. Like this is a, I just showing that like you can run a service as large as ours with just a couple of machines. It's possible. Um, I'd say there are never any headaches, uh, but it is possible to do. So just quickly to wrap up a little bit, so we have some time for some questions. Um, most of our sites are now hosted on this Drupal multi-site for the on-campus system. 900 sites in production, another 500 in various other states of existence, development, testing, training, sandboxes. You know, some of us run one random test, they exist. And sometimes, because we are a very busy team, unless somebody tells us or reminds us of it, it doesn't always get cleaned up right away. So we have a lot of sites that are just sitting out there and we're like, okay, we gotta run a query and find out when is this last updated. So um, one thing that was great about cited, uh, like the multi-site was it allowed a lot of code reuse. We could actually could reuse the same code, um, have the same setup as far as directories and everything. Like this is where you link off to all of the models that everyone has available to them. They can use if they want to. Um, we can set the basic standards out of the box and deployments were quite simple because we just really had to, um, most cases you see your symbolic on the system be like if you're pointing to the new version of the module, the deployment is done. Everyone got it because we're all running on the same system. Um, actually, one thing I didn't, I didn't touch on, actually, sorry, I just realized I missed it when I talked about Pantheon. So we I did a couple of other interesting add-ons to that system. And I think I just skipped over it, um, just so people were aware. So we've done some things like um, panels cloning, so we now have a billion cloning panels. Um, a lot of integration with field with panel things. People use that module a lot. We haven't used that module to do our development of bricks. Um, so there's a lot of things like uh, now ability to schedule and publishing. So it's kind of a scheduler module idea, but integrating with field panel things. Um, so that was a lot of how we built it. Um, other things like um, another one of those type kind of group ownership modules. So there's group, there's organic groups. Neither of them worked perfectly for us because we were heavily involved in the panel paints. We would have had to develop a custom integration anyway. So we developed our own version called uh, Content Ownership right now. It's going through some trials and tribulations. We're, we're actually working on new versions of that. Um, but it's um, allowed us to basically say if you are part of the um, marketing department, you own this section of the site. They can just check off that they own that and they have that access there without having to worry about other permissions and things like that. So it just kind of overrides everything. It makes it very easy for people to assign an entire section of the site to somebody. I'm sorry, I skipped over that. It was kind of a, some of, just a few of the things we've been custom deving. Um, so when it comes to the multi-site, some other things that we have is some of the good and some of the bad. So we have some drawbacks here. So since we have a single core installation, there's not a whole lot of room right now to do big changes. Um, so like you are kind of stuck with, um, you know, everyone's sharing this. So you can't like make grand changes to configuration or anything like that. So we kind of have to leave Drupal itself alone. Even though you want to, it's core. And I'm not talking about touching core and editing core, but um, you know, you can't, Big broad changes to the server in any way because everyone's there. Um, you can easily shut down a site. Other big problem, they would run multi sites, actually, we are running the uh, graphic shut up there. So there's only a few machines that one DB server. A single site can affect the entire network. If someone is just doing something crazy on their site, they can eat up the memory of the whole machine. Um, so, we have to be very careful about monitoring um, and knowing what people are doing when you have a long query being run um, we have to obviously put a stop to. And it gives us an insight as well when that happens though into like we can tell when modules are needing a little bit of twerk, uh, sorry, 
tweaking, I'm going to say twerking, tweaking, uh, um, models are reading what they want. Um, so we have to do tweaking here and there to actually make sure these models are not like running away with memory, running away with uh, CPUs. Um, so that's a big part of uh, what we have to do on a day to day basis. Uh, one thing that happened to us is, uh, this is from Alberta. Uh, the government of Alberta released their uh, compensation disclosure list a year ago. Am I like out of time? Yes. Oh, I am. Sorry, I forgot. We started ten, at uh, 10 30. Okay. So, anyway, we uh, released our compensation disclosure list, and uh, when that came out, we were very busy with the Ajax press, kind of took down some of our services. Uh, for a little bit, I've been trying to figure out what was going on and make a bunch of changes to our configuration. Of course, again, it affects everyone. So we have to do that balance between performance and stability. Um, so another thing is uh, sites for everyone has caused other headaches. Like, should all these sites actually exist when it comes to, again, now 900 sites? Um, is there a good business and marketing plan for why these sites exist? So that's what we're trying to push now, to make sure that people have a good plan of what their site is going to do for them before we actually allow them to have a site. We now have lots of stale content on these microsites. Uh, we spend a lot of time on monitoring scripts. Like, we have a lot of bash scripting now to actually check what our servers are doing and warning us when we see spikes. Um, and so we have a lot of administrative tasks come up because we have to manage proxy and all that kind of stuff for like 1,500 different sites. So this is a major motivation for restarting on Pantheon. So to conclude here, the nonprofit model was the key, I think, to adopt the adoption of the platform. The rate of adoption, I think, was a bit of an uh, issue because we were getting bidding our website so quickly, we weren't looking at the standardization that we had to think about in the early days. So it was sort of a lesson learned for us that we really needed to think more about standardizing as we moved into the service. So we put a lot of that effort now into the platform to have a new building. So, fortunately, I don't know how much time I have for questions because there's people moving on to the next one, but I'd love to answer some. So, my handle is dpfitzy pretty much everywhere. That's my University of Calgary address, that's Twitter, that's GitHub, that's um, Drupal.org. So, no one else has that name, so it's, it actually works really well for me. Yes? Yeah, I was just wondering to get your uh, thoughts around uh, Drupal 8, and then also I see that you're in your panels and it's constantly with friends that you look into. Yeah, so that's something we've been looking really into now is, um, of course, the future in terms of like where can our development we have done, especially on the Pantheon environment and around this whole idea of bricks, move into something like Drupal 8. So we're aware of things like paragraphs and all that kind of thing, but we haven't actually used it yet because we're focused kind of on being a little bit behind the curve uh, to make sure that uh, we are actually just there with modules that we know and exist on Drupal 7. We know some of them aren't quite ready for Drupal 8. So I know the paragraphs are the big one that's kind of jumped in to fill the void a little bit. And I've heard it's really great, but I haven't myself used it much. Um, and I have to see how it can fill the gap with what we have now. But I think it sounds like it really can, like in terms of how it's uh, managing the stack and everything now. But Drupal 8 as a platform, like yeah, I've been looking into that now, like it's got a lot of great things I would love to use. but. It was more we kind of had to wait behind a little bit to make sure that like every piece that we now use across these 900 sites is available, or as much as we can. Yes? What's the size of your team? Uh, team is small, um, so we now have it split up a little bit between three different general areas. So we have a service area that has four people. Uh, so we have a service lead and, a, well, two students, one just recently left, so we're going to hire somebody back on. So it's mostly student-centered, it's doing a lot of the customer service side. Um, as well as a very experienced person leading them. We have a planning group which has a couple of people in there, um, like a QA, BA, and a planning person uh, doing a lot of project management kind of stuff. And there's a development team which has a uh, lead, junior developer, and two seniors, including myself. Um, and then we have our manager as well. So it's a small team, we're talking less than a dozen um, to manage all of this stuff. So uh, we have in the past hired contractors to fill the gaps, particularly when we first moved to Pantheon, we had contractors with us for about a year and a half um, to help us get into the system because we had so much development to do with yeah. a few people. So I know we had another question in the back. I only want to ask that question. How big are we? Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to ask? I know a lot about how to get out. <laughs> so 
Please drop me a line if you have any more questions on this whole thing. Um, I'm fully free to talk about any of this and you know, it's just talk when you see me. Um, but as I said, that handle is pretty much everywhere. Um, and Google and everything. All right, thanks guys.